Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and this is a podcast recording of the Old Testament. Although this is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, every effort's been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. I'll be using for the text the Joseph Smith translation of the Old Testament, along with many commentaries from general authorities of the Church, BYU professors, Bible scholars, and others. This format will be very detailed, and so if you want a deep analysis of the Old Testament, you come to the right place. Thanks for your attendance. Alrighty, this is going to be Second Samuel chapter 9. And David said, Is there yet any lef- that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant, whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not any yet of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lo-Debar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lobadar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at thy table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldst look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread all way at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a son whose name was Mekah, and all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table, and was lame on both his feet. The record of this period of David's reign, indeed, of his life, would have been incomplete if the memory of his friendship with Jonathan had passed without leaving a trace behind. But it was not so. When he had reached the climax of his power, he made inquiry for any descendant of Saul to whom he might show the kindness of God for Jonathan's sake. There is something deeply touching alike in this moving remembrance of the past and in the manner of it. While David was at the zenith of his power, which shows his true character and proves that success had not yet injured his better nature, this was but one legitimate scion of the royal house left, Mephibosheth, who bore in his lamed body the memorial of that sad day on Mount Gilboa. It is another bright glimpse into the moral state of the people that all this time the poor neglected descendant of fallen royalty should have found a home and support in the house of the wealthy chieftain Makir, the son of Amiel, at Lodbar, near Mahanaim, the scene of Ishbosheth's uh, murder. Yet another evidence was afterwards given of the worth and character of Makir. He had evidently known to appreciate David's conduct toward Mephibosheth, and in consequence became one of his warmest adherents, not only in the time of prosperity, but in that of direst adversity when he dared openly to espouse David's cause and to supply him in his flight with much-needed help. But but to return, the the first care of the king was to send for Ziba, well known as a servant of Saul, perhaps formerly the servant of his household. It is curious to note how, even after David assured him of his friendly intentions, Ziba, on mentioning Mephibosheth, immediately told that he was lame on his feet, as if to avert possible evil consequences. So strongly did the Oriental idea seem rooted in his mind that a new king would certainly compass the death of all the descendants of his predecessor. Something of the same feeling appeared also in the bearing of Mephibosheth when introduced to David. But far other thoughts were in the king's heart. Mephibosheth has was henceforth to be treated as one of the royal princes. His residence was to be at Jerusalem and his place at the king's table, while at the same time all the land formerly belonging to Saul was restored to him for his support. Ziba, whom David regarded as a faithful adherent to his old master's family, was directed and his sons and servants to attend to the royal property of Mephibosheth. 
I'm not sure I'm getting that right, but anyway. We love to dwell upon this incident in the history of David, which forms, so to speak, an, an appendix to the narrative of the first period of his reign, not merely for what it tells us of the king, but as the last bright spot on which the eye rests. Other thoughts also seem to crowd around us as we repeat to ourselves such words as the kindness of God and for Jonathan's sake. Thus, much would a man do, and so earnestly would he inquire for the sake of an earthly friend whom he had loved. Is there not a higher sense in which, for jo- in which the for Jonathan's sake can bring us comfort and give us direction in the service of love? And that was by Alfred Edersheim. Uh, that's the end of chapter 9. We'll see you next time. Bye.